our last our last discussion for unit 3.2 is going to be building on what we talked about last time with neutral evolution. Now, if we can assume that most evolution is neutral, then we can look for those examples where we have parts of the genome, maybe genes or parts of a gene, that are not evolving neutrally. And that's kind of very cool and interesting. So in a way, the neutral theory gives us like a null hypothesis. And then we can test other parts to see if they're violating that null hypothesis. And if they are, then that tells us something very interesting about that gene or that part of the gene, meaning it's evolving, it's under natural selection, there's something interesting going on that we then may want to study. Now, to do this, the most common way is in protein coding genes. And so we're going to start there. So we're going to look at the difference between synonymous mutations and non-synonymous mutations. Now, if a protein is evolving neutrally, then what you are going to see is that we really are not going to see a strong difference between synonymous and non-synonymous mutations. In fact, if we do a little bit of a correction and normalize them so that we are putting them on equal footing as far as how many can occur in a certain stretch of DNA, then we would expect to see roughly, or at least not significantly, more than 50% non-synonymous and 50% synonymous neutrality. Now, that's usually not the case for proteins because proteins usually fall under one of two categories. And one of these categories you've actually already seen in the worksheets. And that is what we call purifying selection. Okay? So purifying selection occurs when most mutations that are synonymous, because, well, by definition, a synonymous mutation is neutral. So when a mutation occurs at a synonymous site, it's not subject to natural selection. It might be kept, might be lost, it's going to fluctuate randomly due to genetic drift, but there's going to be no force on it. But in purifying selection, when a mutation occurs at a non-synonymous site, so if we mutate the DNA and that changes the amino acid sequence, then if it's purifying selection, we are going to see that most of the time that mutation will not be kept. Natural selection will work to remove those non-synonymous mutations. So I'm actually going to type in here just so we can keep track as we go. So let's make these images just a little bit smaller. I think it's helpful to kind of see these as we work through it. Okay. So these are examples of where they found signs of natural selection in different groups. It's kind of a cool example. We'll get to it here in a little bit. But under purifying selection, when we compare our non-synonymous mutations to synonymous mutations, which the ratio is Ka to Ks. And in that equation, Ka is an adjusted version of the non-synonymous mutations, and Ks is an adjusted version of the synonymous mutations. So under purifying selection, this Ka, the non-synonymous mutations are very, very low. Very few of those are kept around. So that's a very low number. And this Ks is going to be just kind of, it's going to stay steady in all of these examples. So some are kept, some are lost, but it, it builds up over time. And so we end up with a very low number over a larger number, which of course is a fraction, right? Like 1 over 5, 1 fifth. So that is going to be less than 1. So under purifying selection, we see this ratio, this comparison of synonymous and non-synonymous mutations is significantly less than 1. Okay, Let's look at, oops, I want to just pull that up to the top. No, that's fine. We'll move up as we go. Okay, The other type of selection that we can see under when we're looking at proteins uh, that is less common but still uh, an important part is where we see what we call positive selection. And in positive selection, the reverse is true. Ks kind of stays the same. Some are kept, some are lost. But these non-synonymous ones, if it's under strong positive selection, that number will get very large. So that Ka on the top of the denominator is quite large. The Ks stays about the same. So if we have 5 on the top or 8 on the top and 2 or 3 on the bottom, that number is going to be greater than 1. So a Ka to Ks value that is greater than 1 represents positive selection. And then finally, our null hypothesis, which we've already talked about, which is neutral. Oh, sorry. Neutral, this Ka is roughly the same as the Ks. And so that's going to be not significantly different or really pro approximately 1. Okay? 
need to make these just a little bit smaller. Let's move them out over here. Okay, that'll work. All right, so there you go. You should know that and you should know examples. And so let's talk about what types of genes we would expect to see exhibiting these different um, signs of selection. So start with neutral, that's the easiest one. Of course, with neutral evolution, there's no sign of selection at all. It's evolving neutrally. So what kind of protein would be evolving neutrally? And this is probably the most rare of the three. There might be portions of the protein that are evolving neutrally, but very few proteins over their entire length evolve completely neutrally. And that's because proteins usually serve a function. They're important. So if you mutate it, either it's going to be a good thing because it'll do something new or a bad thing, but it's not often going to be neutral unless it's a synonymous mutation. So those just build up, build up, but if these are not pushed by natural selection, then these will build up also. So although it's rare, a neutrally evolving protein would not be an important protein. It's probably one that eventually will be lost because more and more mutations will build up till it's completely non-functional. So non-important proteins evolve neutrally, and there aren't very many proteins that are like that. Positive selection are cool because if we see this, if we see a Ka to Ks value that is significantly greater than 1, what that means is it's been under strong selection to do something new. And so these are genes that are important, they're critical for function and survival, and not only that, but they may differentiate the differences between two species. So for instance, uh, this is a group of plants that colonized the Hawaiian Islands, kind of a founder effect thing. And then because there wasn't much competition on the island when they got there, they diversified and started doing all of these incredibly different things. On the mainland, they're all just basically flowering prairie uh, uh, plants. But on Hawaii, they, some of them look like yucca, some of them look like mosses, some of them are vines, some even are tree-like. So they've had this massive radiation, and many of their genes show a strong sign of positive selection because they've been adapted and pushed by the environment as new mutations build up. Those have been selected for, and we now are doing something very, very different than our ancestor did. So genes that are under strong positive selection are um, genes that are really important and also show the difference between two species. And then finally, purifying selection. Now think about this. If you have lots of synonymous mutations which don't change the protein, and lots of non-synonymous mutations that are being removed, so we really see very, very few of those, maybe even none, then the proteins themselves are not going to change. Their function is going to remain basically identical. So purifying genes that are under purifying selection, number one, they're very, very important, right? They're critical for survival. Otherwise, natural selection wouldn't be working to remove all of these non-synonymous mutations. And they're very, very conserved in function. So if I compared a gene in a scorpion and a gene in a spider and found that they were under strong purifying selection, I could very safely predict that those genes would be doing pretty much the same thing in both those species. Okay? So a protein with no effect on impact, with no effect on impact. Wow, that's a badly written sentence. I, don't, I must have not proof, proofread that when I went through and modified this slide for last semester. A protein with no effect on fitness is what that, that should say. So let's change that if I can get in there. Oh, I see why. There we go. With no effect on fitness. Okay. A protein that has evolved to do different jobs in two different species, right? That's positive selection. And a protein important for survival and doing the same job in two species. So that's just a review of what we just talked about, okay? So just make sure you recognize those. On the exam, you might see matching questions or true false or just multiple choice where you need to be able to identify these. So re realize the null hypothesis, the kind of the original assumption is neutrality. If it violates that, it could fall into either positive or purifying selection. Okay, and this is just showing you those same things and where we would have neutral mutations, right? No change at all, and where we would have a positive one. Now realize this K to KS value is an adjusted version. We just can't count them up because we need to make an adjustment for how many possible there are. Okay, last concept here. Um, sorry, two more concepts. Uh, first is that different parts of the protein may be under different selection pressures. So we might have some parts of an enzyme that are really, really strongly positively uh, impacted, that meaning they're, they're doing something new, but the rest of the protein is conserved and under strong purifying selection, so we'd expect it to be roughly the same. And so not only can we look at this uh, from one gene to another, but we could even look at it from, hey, this part of the gene versus this part of the gene versus this part of the gene. 
So it's a very, very useful process. Okay, here's the last concept. We can also look for signs of selection if we are looking within a species. So the Ka to Ks ratio is one that we can use to test between two different species, populations that are no longer interbreeding. But we can also do it within a species. And to do this, we might need a, uh, an outgroup. But if we have different levels of variability, so here's the take home message. If the diversity within a species is equivalent to the diversity between species, so we've got right here, then that gene's evolving neutrally. If the diversity within a species is much greater than the difference between them, then that's purifying selection, meaning that, um, that uh, these have not uh, evolved to take on new function. They're doing the same thing in these two species. And if the difference within a species is less than, uh, significantly less than the difference between species, then that shows strong positive selection, meaning those genes have been driven and driven and driven to do something new and important in those two species. So we could use this as an estimate for genes that were under selection in one uh, population, but maybe not in another. All right, that's it. That's the end of unit 3.2. Remember worksheet um, number three is due uh, coming up soon. Check the calendar depending on which section you're in. It's either due next week if you're in um, uh, Monday, Wednesday uh, class, it's due this week. So. Um, Anyway, I don't, I don't remember. I don't have the calendars here in front of me. But oh, actually, I do. Let me, just so I don't confuse you. Okay. Um, so for um, Monday, Wednesday class, the worksheet is due on March 30th. For um, the Tuesday, Thursday class, your worksheet is due on March 31st. Tuesday, March 31st. So I'll post notices on Blackboard. You've got the due dates that are there already, but I'll post an additional notification. So just make sure you do that. Um, sometime also, it may be up by the time you're listening to this, but I will also post a little bit of a guideline and a review. But remember, um, even though you may not be able to come to campus, they're getting a little bit more strict about regulations there, please send me emails. Um, I will do a review session and post the video so you can get some good guidance on the worksheet. But you're still welcome to email me um, if you have questions and want to go over anything on that worksheet or any other part of the course. All right, stay safe out there.